Hello everyone and welcome to Handmade Hero, show where we code a complete game live on stream. Um, I apologize, I was sick this week, so my voice is a little gravelly today. <clears throat> and uh, But I'm feeling okay, I'm not feeling too bad, so I'm, I'm assuming uh, that we'll be okay here. We'll see how it goes. Uh, we don't have anything too ridiculous planned for today, so I'm, I'm assuming it'll be fine. Um... <clears throat> what we stopped on uh, last week was actually kind of promising. Uh, I had kind of anticipated things being a little more difficult than they were, uh, which is always a surprise in programming because, you know, uh, a lot of times in programming where you were more focused on the backwards surprise where you're like, I thought this was going to be easy or I thought this wouldn't take that long, but then it did, right? Because of unforeseen complexities that you know, you didn't anticipate, and so, you know, now you're, you're having to do more work or spend more time on something than you thought, uh, but sometimes you get the opposite, and it turned out we ended up getting the opposite here. We were playing around with our sprites, and uh, saying, I was saying, okay, I gotta figure out how to do the sorting now on these guys, uh, but it turned out, actually, that editing the Y values just as a direct slide proportional to the alignment uh, as we did last Sunday, turned out to give us basically perfect results. Like, it's exactly what I wanted. Uh, and I haven't seen any problems with it. Like, it does exactly what I want um, pretty much all the time. And so all we really needed to do today, um, b before saying, all right, great, <clears throat> is we just have to do a little bit more formalization of that uh, to make sure that we've got it where we want it. Now, uh, just to explain, there's two parts of the formalization that need to happen. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're both a little bit different. So if I, like, uh, let, me, let me try to create a circumstance that's a little bit clearer here. So, you know, uh, let's suppose we've got the hero on here. Well, you can already see, right? So... We haven't set the alignment points for the hero. And uh, we made this nice debug camera, by the way. I know for the folks who uh, uh, haven't been, been watching the past couple episodes, you may have missed it. Uh, our debug camera is pretty great now. So uh, yeah, we were just in the middle of doing that stuff. Uh, so we probably should finish up some of that. Ooh, it looks like we've got a weirdness there though. As I'm saying, it's great. I'm noticing that we were using the wrong axes there for sliding. Oh. Yeah, we are. We're not using the debug axes, actually. We're using the game axes for sliding. We should change that. In fact, let me just change that right now before I even say what I was going to say. Did you notice that? I don't know if anyone noticed that but me. Um, probably if, if no one uh, played around with the, with the debug camera, they wouldn't have noticed it. Um, but anyway, we did some really cool stuff with the debug camera. You can now switch from game camera to debug camera, which is pretty cool. We solved for the you know, it's not a complicated solve, but it's just fun to get stuff like little stuff like that right. Uh, we solved for the trig to place the orbit camera at the same place as the game camera, so you, you get a seamless switch uh, when you switch into debug camera mode, which is really nice. I like that. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I noticed just now when I was sliding around, we're using the wrong axes, and, and that's true. You can see here, uh, we get the camera X, uh, Y, and Z axes here, and we use those, right? We process the, the input here, and then we go in here and do the use debug camera. And here's us processing that transfer, right? So the axes that we want are actually in here. Uh, they're part of this debug camera O, right? That's, that's what's actually what we would want. And so we actually need some way of uh, pulling that part out in order to properly build the debug camera, right? So if you look at what happens, one thing that's kind of nice about it is debug camera pan is actually used later on. So if I wanted to, I actually could do this and split these two out, right? That's totally possible. And so what I can do is I can actually say, oh, all right, um, if I just grab this part and move it down here, uh, then what will happen is, uh, well, and you know, we may even not quite want to do that because we may want to 
to use as much as we can on the input. So for example, if we want to use the rotation stuff, we can. The only thing that we would be wrong about would be right here, the camera pan part. So what I can do, I can even go a little bit further and say, oh, actually, you know what I should do is say, here we are in, you know, using the debug camera and whatever. Uh, let me actually do a second pass on the input here. So I'm just going to say, look, this input, just as we were doing before, uh, I'm just going to grab out the part where we do the panning. And that way, we still can update everything on the same frame, right? Because I could have, I need the axes that I'm computing here, but those axes are dependent on the input because you might be rotating around. But then I want to update the position based on those axes. So I, do, I, I could store them for the next frame. That seems like bad to introduce a frame of lag. So instead, I'm just going to do the partial update here. And then after I know what this orientation is, I can go ahead here um, and, and snap these, these axes to use, right? So that allows me to say, look, if we're using the debug camera, uh, and I can actually roll that into this code because this input only needs to happen in that case. So we can actually put it right here, in fact. Um, so if you know we're using the debug camera and the input uh, is valid, so we're actually doing input, we're not just you know doing some kind of processing that doesn't involve any input. Uh, then all I need to do is just check to see if this part is down here, right? If the middle mouse button is down. And if the middle mouse button is down, then you're doing that panning, right? So I can just say, look, if the middle mouse button is down, uh, do the pan. We need to make sure that the alt button is not down, though, uh, because if the alt was down, we would do the other one. Uh, so we need to also say, look, don't let the alt be down. But that's about it. And so then when we do this, this update of the debug camera pan, then that will flow into here properly. So the only other thing we would then need is we just need to do debug camera X. Uh, and oops. And debug camera Y. And then what we do is when we flow through this code, uh, we just need to say, look, if we're using debug camera, so we've built the orientation matrix for the debug camera, uh, then what I can do is just get that, uh, I can get the axes out of there. Now, these things need to persist down to here, right? Because I need to be able to use them. I need to be able to use both of those. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and put them uh, up. I could also just always compute them if I want to, right? Uh, you know, this, this isn't something that's super computation intensive. So if I want to, I can actually do it like this, where I'm always going to compute that, right? That's totally fine as well. Uh, so if I want to, I can make it look a little bit more like this. Um, and as this sort of falls out, we could probably simplify this code a little bit too. But you get the idea. All right. So assuming that that actually happens, uh, I guess that makes it even less necessary to do this, because actually these can just happen in here. Uh, where they would actually be used. So right here, we could just do that, uh, where we just do uh, get column. And so what I'm going to do is take the orientation matrix, and as we've gone over many, many, many times, column of the ori that orientation matrix tell me the axes of the object uh, that we would be using, that we would place using that orientation matrix. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and pull out uh, the x and y axes uh, of that matrix to get my debug camera X and debug camera Y. Now, at that point, we don't really need uh, these hanging around anymore. But you know, whatever, I'm just going to leave them that way, because it seems fine to do so. So I'm going to go ahead and build here. And uh, let me just take a look D mouse P. What's going on there? Ah, so D mouse P is actually just uh, the difference that happens here. So I think that's actually something that um, we could again preserve. So, you know, there's no issue with doing that because if we didn't have input, then there's just no, no delta mouse, which is exactly what we would expect, right? All right, so that minor patch there now should give us proper movement everywhere. And you can see that it does. Uh, so now we properly do the debug camera. Before, again, we were just 
we were doing proper camera relative motion, we were just doing it relative to the game camera. And that doesn't really help us, right? Because we're only viewing from the game camera when we're not in debug mode. So why would that, you know, why would we ever want to do that? <clears throat> All right, so hopefully that made sense to everybody. Now back to our story. So let me switch back to game camera here for a second. Uh, what I was trying to say before is, all right, so, you know, if you take a look uh, at one of these sprites and, you know, I mean, there's the, the hero. If I switch into debug camera mode, uh, I can go in here and inspect what's going on, right? I can, I can look at how we're actually rendering the world and you can see it there, right? How it sort of stacks up. Um, so what I wanted to be able to do here was have a coherent idea of how alignment points would actually be working uh, with the system that allows the sprites to to show up in Z properly, right? And we did a great job of that. I was really surprised that the slide in Y was as simple as it was. Let that be a lesson. But uh, now we have to talk about actually setting these alignment points permanently and a couple things that we need to do in order to make all this work properly. So first of all, even if we were to just do what we already did, which is slide the alignment points in Y, uh, the current algorithm that we have is not quite sufficient. The reason that the algorithm isn't quite sufficient is because if you imagine what would happen with rota rotating one of these, so imagine that it was spinning around, we don't currently take into account tilting of the X and Y axes in order to figure out where we would slide. So when we rotate something, we need to have an idea about what that rotation means uh, in this sort of slanted space that keeps the sorting accurate, right? Uh, and so I'm gonna probably go throw in, like maybe we'll just make the, the fist rotate continuously uh, or the head rotate continuously so you can see what I mean. So that's the first thing we have to address. Uh, th these are in no particular order, actually, since the first thing. That's one thing we have to address. And the second thing we have to address uh, is that if you look at how these things are being aligned right now, we have this notion of alignment points. So if I go in uh, to the editor here and I just say, look, I'm going to pick uh, one of these things, like, I don't know, uh, I want to pick the, the alignment of, of this uh, base piece here, right? Here's a list of all those alignment points, uh, and you can actually see why it shifted to the side, right? Because we were playing with the, the alignment points there, and uh, when so you know this right here was shifted to the side, that it should really be more about halfway, right? So you can kind of see where that alignment point is there, um, and the alignment points obviously I should I need to make it so that it, uh, if the Alt key is down, we don't process clicks. Uh, do that for ease of use. But anyway, if we go back here and take a look at what it looks like from the game camera, right? Maybe I turn this guy off here. You can see that the alignment point's not in the right place. So the actual place the alignment point needs to be is like, you know, probably like right there, right? That's like where it looks like it's more correctly anchored into the ground, like at the point that it's supposed to be, right? So it's probably something like that. Um, and then this point, which is where the head anchors on, probably is like maybe there, I, you know, I don't know exactly, right? Um, but it's something like that. And so then if you take a look at uh, what that looks like, and maybe I'll keep it turned off for now. Uh, if we go into the debug camera mode, right? Yeah, I really got to fix that because otherwise it's going to keep deselecting every time uh, I rotate around. But if you look at sort of where those points are, right? Um, they don't really, uh, they are drawn in the correct location <clears throat> for the object that they're on, right? Because we compute what the axes are to render that object, and then we move the, those um, points to the right locations. What I don't remember if we did is something that would do the right thing for the person we're attaching. Meaning, I don't know if we take into account both sets of axes or if we assume that those axes are going to actually be the same. So, what I don't know, and this is the other part we have to look at, is once you actually snap one of these things on there, so we've got this base of neck thing, right? Are those points now snapped together properly? Do they line up 
correctly. You know what I mean? Uh, and so if we take a look at, at where the, um, the different points are, so this is, those are the two points for the body. I'm gonna grab the head here. Um, those are the two points for the body. There's the point for the head uh, that's supposed to align with it. Let's say I add one on here, right? So if I were to create an arbitrary, oops, that's supposed to be to parent, sorry. If I was to create an arbitrary displacement, would that still align to, to the right place, you know? Um, and if you look at it, 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 it seems like clearly that it's not because that's the point that we're supposed to be aligning to, right? Um, but here's the point that we're saying we're aligning and it doesn't line up, right? They don't, so they're not, you know, they're supposed to be snapping together. They're not snapping together. And again, that's because we're changing those axes and I don't think we actually did uh, the work to say, make sure that these two points in these two coordinate systems actually end up in the same apparent visual, like location uh, to the viewer, at least if not in world space in their entirety, right? So that's another thing that we have to deal with and we wanna make sure that that's correct as well. So those are the two things that we have to do, but fortunately they're um, quite easy, meaning there's nothing unknown about that process. Now, again, anytime we're dealing with 3D math, there's a lot of stuff involved and so it might take us a little while to work through it and get it right and get it debugged. So it's not like it's easy as in quick, um, but it is easy from the standpoint of we're not going into uncharted territory like we were before when I was like, I don't really know what the best way to create these sprites in a way that sorts them into this real 3D environment, uh, in a, you know, given that we're doing so many things that normal 2D, 3D games don't do, like with real perspective shifts and stuff like that. A lot of times they try to be more isometric to avoid a lot of these problems. So we really went in on our territories there. We came out the other end in fabulous form, which I'm, uh, you know, uh, luck was with us. So that was pretty good. Um, you know, you persevere, sometimes luck is with you. So this is not as hard as what I thought we were going to have to do which is gonna be much more explorational. All right, so let's just start looking at the, that code and let's try to bring that code in line with what we need it to do uh, based on those things that I said. So here's the entity code and we really have, I'm gonna move it to the window so that my head's not in the way. So here's the entity code and we really have uh, you know, a pretty straightforward thing we're doing here. It's just there's a lot of bookkeeping involved so it's a little bit complicated all the stuff that goes in, right? So what you can see here is we've got these piece index things, right? That's a particular entity can have any number of these pieces. And what you can see here is those pieces, they kind of come together and you say, all right, uh, I've got these piece indexes. I've got um, a particular visible piece. Uh, it's got, you know, some kind of deformations that I might want to put on it, right? Like these axis deform stuff. Uh, those are things for some of that procedural animation that we're doing. Bob is the same, right? It's all this sort of stuff, floor displacement, all these things. So we're computing some animation quantities. Those will probably get a little more complicated and a little bit more well-defined over time uh, as we push more down the animation side of things. But basically we've got those coming into it. Uh, and then what we want to know is, all right, uh, let's go ahead and get our, uh, this part is for picking and stuff that we use, the dev IDs and stuff, that's for the, uh, for doing like, you know, the editor and stuff like that. So we don't have to worry about that too much. Uh, but then assuming that this thing isn't a light or a cube, because lights and cubes are actually 3D. So we don't have to do uh, any like uh, mojo, you know, we don't have to do extra work to make sure that those things place themselves into the environment properly. We can just hand those to the renderer and because they're actual 3D shapes, it just works through the pipeline, right? So really what we're worried about now is just this one case here where we're saying this is an entity piece, uh, this is a piece of an entity that's uh, got just a sprite, you know, it's got a bitmap that sticks onto a plane, right? 
So here we are with that, and we get the bitmap back, uh, and we take a look at uh, what the parent piece is going to be. So when we do that parent piece thing, what that's telling us is who we're supposed to snap to, right? So you know we create um, one of these uh, sprites. We say maybe it has a body, and then we say maybe it's got a head, and we stick the head onto the body or something like this, right? So then when we do that, we say, all right, let's find the alignment that's whatever you said we needed to use to stick these two together. So we're just, we're getting, uh, for any given piece, we say, what alignment point on its parent did you want it to stick to? You know, what, what are we supposed to stick it to, right? And where's the alignment point on this thing that we want to use to stick, right? So this one is the one that says, this one is the one that gets the one that we're, you know, that's on us, the, you know, the, the snap point on us. And this one is the one that gets the snap point on our parent. Now, since there isn't always a parent, that's why we pre-select uh, the ground point of the entity where the entity is standing. Because if we don't have any other information, if we don't have someone to stick, our, stick us uh, to, we'll stick to the ground, right? So after we do all of this, right, we've got all of that information ready. Uh, then we say, okay, now it's time to actually do this computation. So here is where we need to, to actually produce uh, the, the final results. So this is the part, you know, all of that stuff really doesn't affect us. It's just getting all of the bookkeeping in place. Even if all that stuff were wrong, it's okay. That's debugging for a different day the part where we come out with two points, now we've got them. So the question is, stick them together. And that's our job today, stick those two points together, right? Okay. So the first thing you can see here uh, is we're taking the initial placement point and that initial placement point uh, is the you know is this alignment point here and the thing that you can see kind of right off the bat is this world P from a line P uh, that's assuming that it can produce a, a world point from a particular alignment point in one of the parent sprites now I'm skeptical that it's actually doing that correctly at this point um, and so I want to see if that's actually true so you can see the sprite values here, and you can see the alignment point here, uh, and you can see the scaled x-axis, scaled y-axis, so you can, you can see these alignment values, right, uh, being what they are. Now, just looking at that, you can kind of see uh, that will be correct if and only if the values min p that we recorded takes into account the y bias that we were talking about before. Okay, so here's our sprite values for upright call. This is the one we were talking about here. Uh, and what you can see is this, uh, this part right here where the min p gets, gets created. Um, although I was skeptical that we were doing it correctly, it does look like we did, right? Uh, we took the align p and we said, all right, whatever the alignment point is that we're using, we're gonna interpret it out this way. Um, and you know, that's where it's going to be drawn, right? That's at the min p. So it really does sort of correctly represent that minimum base point using the slid out y uh, that we were talking about before. Who knew? So that's a good first step. It means that we're already in a, in good shape for creating exactly what we need to create. Now this isn't handling the rotation like we wanted to, but again, like I said, the rotation part will come in later. Uh, and the reason that this isn't uh, handling the rotation part properly is again, because this uh, alignment Y slide has to uh, take into account when these axes start to shift, the actual points, how they should be moved out in Y need to be uh, considered individually. So this part is going to get more complicated, but before we start comp uh, making it more complicated, 
I want to get it correct for the non-rotating case for obvious reasons, right? Like, let's start with the simpler case first. All right, so that actually seems pretty reasonable. And then, so the question is, well, what about the scaled x-axis, scaled y-axis part of things, uh, and this align p part right here? So that world p uh, from align p that's happening there, when that uh, uses those scaled axes, again, that seems like that should be correct because those axes that we're recording here are actually the ones that are being used uh, you know, with the, with the lie down taken into account. So that point should slide along the slanted plane exactly the way that we think it should, right? So all of that seems pretty good to me, uh, and I'm not seeing any real reason why that part shouldn't produce correct answers. Now let's just take a quick second to make sure that what we see on the screen reflects that uh, and, and there isn't some other you know, indication that that's not actually happening. So if I go ahead back to the game here uh, and I select one of these, uh, you know, uh, and I select one of these guys like the, the person we were working with before, what I wanna see now is if I go went in here and I slid this point around, uh, maybe the easiest way to do it would be to get right in there and looking at the plane almost side on, right? Uh, and so if I select this now and I go to the, those alignment points, this green point is this one here. Let's just make sure it actually slides along that plane properly, right? And it really does look like it's correct. Like if I go all the way up to the upper corner of that plane there, right? Um, and then I, I come back here and I take a look at it a little bit more uh, closely. So let me uh, grab that again you know, it's right where it should be. So I would say that our initial attempt to sort of get those values out, I'm, I'm relatively comfortable with that. It doesn't look like there's a lot of surprises there. So that's good. All right, so now let's talk about the part where we try to actually align to that snapped point. Because since we've seen that it doesn't seem to work, but these points look correct, that suggests that, at least for the non-rotated case, we aren't doing the work we need to do in this next part of the algorithm here, right? Because if we're producing the alignment point on our parent correctly, but we're not snapping to that point the way we think we should, that kind of only leaves one place for the bug, at least in the obvious sense. All right, so here we are getting the world dimensions of this piece that we're going to be putting down. And here's us asking uh, for the sprite values for upright part of things. So that gets us back into this routine. And what we're doing is we're passing the X and Y axis of rotation that we want, imagining that we were in the plane uh, eventually. So this is just giving us regular 2D axes that we want for our sprite. Uh, and that alignment point is the one that we have computed here, right? Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. Initial P is the point we're aligning to. Align P is the percentage in our space where the point we're trying to align, you know, where that would, would, would occur, right? Like where that snapping point should be. And so now we kind of have to figure out, okay, how is that going to work? Now this gets again, more complicated because we have to remember that these planes, um, we may be, the, the, when we snap these things together, we're not necessarily snapping them together in Z, right? We're snapping them together only from the perspective of the person looking. And I can't really think Think, oh, well, you know what? Let me just show you in the game. I was like, I could draw a diagram, but then I'm like, you know what? Just showing you in the game is probably easier. So if you look at what's going on here, these two sprites are intentionally separated uh, in Z, and the reason that they're separated in Z, and, and you know, they don't really need to be separated that as much as they are, necessarily, um, but the reason that they're separated in Z like that is specifically because we don't want to stack them right on top of each other in the plane because if we stack them right on top of each other in the plane then there's two things that don't work properly 
One is that we wouldn't necessarily get the proper perspective shifting that we might want from things that are supposed to be a little bit tall. But the other thing that we wouldn't get is we wouldn't uh, leave sufficient room for the Z buffer to resolve properly. If they're right in the same plane, you would get potentially Z fighting uh, because since you know there's limited precision arithmetic going on and it's not an infinitely precise plane, you get those little sparkly artifacts that you see sometimes in games when things, uh, it's called Z fighting, when things are trying to write to the Z buffer and they don't precisely calculate the plane equation correctly. So you get some pixels that show through and some pixels that don't show through from underlying objects. So we do want there to be some separation there as well. All right. So we have to kind of define what it means to snap together in this way. Uh, we have to kind of come up with some rules about what we actually expect to be true. And this is somewhat complicated because there are ways that we might want them to be true uh, differ in terms of what we would consider a correct result. So one thing that we could say is true is we could say that from the perspective of the camera, we always want the alignment points to appear as if they're on top of each other, right? Even though when we then zoom rotate around like that, we will see that they are not in fact in the same place in 3D. When we rotate back to here, we would see that they come into alignment. So from our perspective, they would be, right? Now, that would be the correct thing to do if we were concerned only with the concept of an alignment point in the abstract sense. We want to align these two points. But there may be reasons why we don't actually want that to happen. And it's, again, this is actually an aesthetic decision. It has nothing to do with 3D math or anything else. It's, a, it's an, actually an artistic decision. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what I mean here uh, in the hallway by selecting this particular uh, fellow here. I guess, uh, let me go ahead and go into uh, debug cam so I can pick him. Um, yeah, let's, let's say... Let's say that we shrink the head down. <laughs> I know it's going to be a little bit weird, right? Let's say we shrink the head down like that. Uh, and then uh, let me go back to the game camera and let's, uh, let's go back here, right? So as I move across the screen, uh, I want you to pay attention to the location of the head relative to the body. And what you can see is you actually get a sense of perspective, even though these are not 3D. Um, they're 2D sprites and they're aligned to the camera to a certain degree, but because we have allowed some of the 3D to affect the sprites uh, and we allow the full 3D to affect their, pos uh, in, uh, we allow their position to be fully affected in 3D and we allow the slanting of them into full 3D to be partially true, right? We partially orient to the camera and we partially orient to the world. Um, but because we have enough of the 3D coming through, what you can see is the perspective shift on the head is actually fairly pronounced. You can sort, it sort of feels a little bit more 3D as the character moves from side to side because you actually see him tip as if he was a real 3D object, right? So what we don't necessarily want to do, because I think that's a fairly compelling artistic result that we can make use of as we actually build our sprites and align things. What I don't think we want to do is make a rule that says, let's actually pin these two points together using the camera's perspective. Because what that would do is that would actually eliminate some of that 3D motion by using the camera's actual 3D location to adjust the location uh, of the uh, the head and the body, right? It would essentially be fighting the natural 3D motion by introducing this synthetic constraint that doesn't have anything to do with, well, it does have something to do with, but that isn't as close as just the normal result would be to the 3D tilting of that stack of sprites. So I think we want the, the 3D tilting of that stack of sprites to occur. And so what I might propose is the best way to, to talk about our alignment is to say, let's suppose that we were right in line with the camera. So we're going to presuppose that the camera 
cannot be off axis when we're doing alignment. And let's say that the alignment point should line up there, okay? So we will try to do the correct math that forces these points into alignment when you're right down the barrel of the gun, so to speak, right? But when you get to the sides, we will continue to apply that same alignment as if the camera was over there so that we let the natural 3D displacement to the side do the work it would have done, right? So I think that is probably how we want to do it. That way when we're authoring the points, there's a natural way of talking about them. They snap together when we're looking directly at them, you know, like this, they will snap together. But when you move to the side, you'll get that sort of tilting of the stack that gives you, again, that extra feeling of real like tangibility uh, that you don't get with sprites normally because when they move across the screen, you, know, you get no parallax uh, in a 2D game, right? So I think that's what I would like that alignment idea to reflect. Uh, and when we look at how that's going to work, uh, what you can see here is when we call sprite values for upright, we're passing an initial P that is the information that we would need uh, to start with for where we're trying to match. So we're giving it a proper world space location that's actually on the plane of the parent and that is the actual target point that we're trying to snap to. So I would say that we've done our due diligence and we don't really have to worry about that point anymore, at least not till we start uh, addressing the rotation case, which is the second part of it. If I come over here to sprite values for upright and see what we're doing with that, however, because again, remember then the only other thing we really give ourselves is the x wax and the align p. If we look at what we're doing with that, uh, you know, we've got that, you know, so we've got that base p on there. Um, well, I mean, I guess I should, uh, I should be more specific because it's actually a little upstream of the, uh, that the uh, problem occurs. No, what I said is not entirely correct. This piece offset here has actually displaced, right, the snap to point in three dimensions before we've ever actually had a chance to snap to it, right? So in a sense, what I said was a lie the part that I actually need to talk about here is this part right here, and it has happened before we we passed uh, it to sprite values for upright. So that is actually the thing we're gonna have to deal with. Why? Here's why. So sprite values for upright, we get a base P in here, and what you can see is that base P serves as the offset for how we are going to construct the location of our plane. You can see it happening in here, right? You can see uh, the align px shifting us on the axis and the align py shifting us out uh, in uh, along uh, the world y there right and what you can see happening here is that when we're actually doing those computations we have no knowledge uh, actually of where we're actually trying to snap to anymore because this was the the point we were trying to snap to but we already offset it by something we never tell this routine about. So there's no way that sprite values for upright can possibly align this thing because it has no idea, <coughs> right? It just has no idea, uh, you know, where it should put it. Now, we have a couple of choices here. Sprite values for upright doesn't have to be the thing that does that alignment though. So we don't necessarily have to think about it this way. What we could do instead is, for example, this base P is only used for this offset. What we could do is get rid of that base P. So what we could do is say sprite values for upright gives you the alignment as if you were just going to align yourself to world zero. And then outside here, maybe this is where we actually do the snapping, right? It could be. Um, I'm somewhat, comp I find that somewhat compelling, right? Uh, that, that seems pretty interesting. So I think I may start us off by going down that direction. Now, we're probably going to get rid of Z bias. It looks like we'll be able to accomplish the job that we need without Z bias. And that will simplify our backend pipeline because we will no longer have to pass down 
four wide vertices. Um, or if we do want to keep passing down four wide vertices, we can put something else into the W component uh, instead of having to rely on, uh, instead of having to use it for biasing the Z buffer. So it actually, uh, that all is, I think, going to be quite nice now that we've found that we can just use the Y displacement to make this work. But so if I go ahead and get rid of that, uh, then what I could do is say, all right, so the align P, align X thing, all that sort of stuff, if I just now start saying, let's get rid of that base P offset. So when you actually try to get sprite values, we're just going to give you them aligned to the world. And then what you need to do is on the outside, you need to come up with how you're going to do your alignment separately, right? And that seems kind of compelling to me uh, because, oops, um, because that would allow us to do a little bit more, um, that would allow us to take it into a more contextual setting rather than over here where we're just producing these, these sprite uh, sort of, um, these sort of values that, that are isolated to the sprite otherwise. So if we wanted to reproduce the exact situation we have now, it's not particularly difficult. We know that the min p that comes out of here is just not getting offset by this thing, right? So literally all we would have to do is say, well, whatever comes out of there, why am I not able, there we go. Um, whatever comes out of there, I know that I can just displace it by initial p, and that's going to reproduce the exact results I had. So it's pretty easy for me to not actually bother, um, you know, to not disturb anything that we had going on currently or <laughs> or not uh what did i oh <laughs> yeah sorry there we go <laughs> i i accidentally deleted the minus there as well you can see that those are supposed to be minus alignments right because the align piece inside it uh <laughs> so hopefully now yeah uh, you can see we didn't change the alignment at all, so you know we go in and look, and it's exactly stacked the way that we had it before, and everything's fine, right? Um, so now, if we think about how this is working, we now have the alignment points in both of our spaces, uh, and now the question is, how do we make those two alignment points appear to line up to the camera, right? Because that's what we actually want to do. And that allows us to say, oh, well, if we look at what goes on in here, so you see where we're do, you know, where we're, we're looking at this stuff. If I look at initial p, you can see that I don't really use it anywhere else, right? It's only used for that. What that means is I can stop doing this piece offset, this thing here. I can stop doing. Um, I can do these as two separate steps, right? And again, that will give me the exact same result that we already have. Uh, because all I'm doing there is, is applying the offset in two steps instead of one step, right? So I get the same thing. So now what that means is I do actually know the exact alignment point I'm trying to align to. It's this, right? That's the parent point. I know the offset that we want to have in world space, right? So I have an actual displacement that I'm supposed to get because this piece is, is this piece, right? Uh, and I furthermore know what I want, uh, I furthermore know the point that on me that I'm trying to snap, you know, to my parent, because that's actually coming out here. The sprite min p is the point in on this sprite. Before I adjust it at all, that's the offset in me that I'm trying to snap to, right? That, that point. Um, I said that a little bit wrong. This is the basis, sprite min p is the basis point you would draw the sprite around. Zero, zero, zero is in this, in this sprite space is the point we would snap to, right? We had zero be the point you would snap to. So we know that if we just aligned, if we just figure out how to move this thing from being centered around zero, zero, zero as the snap point, if we just move zero, zero to the place we want it to be snapped to, we would be done, right? Now let's verify that to ourselves a little bit. Suppose I get rid of the piece offset, right? So now we don't have that additional offset that we're asking for here. Um, we wanna get rid of that. And let's see if now we snap directly, because we should snap directly one to one. So if I look at what's going on now, what I should see, and actually it's, I'm a little bit weirded out. Why don't I see anything there? So I'm glad I did this because I should have seen, 
that much more like I'm not sure where the Z offset would be coming from that Z offset looked pretty significant didn't it so I'm not sure okay all right I take it back I'm a little confused so uh, there's something else we need to account for here if we don't add in the piece offset this is supposed to center us about zero 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 right um, well okay so no there is one more piece of it if you look at what's going on here the y-axis part has not actually put us at the location that we would need to be because the y-axis you can see actually isn't taken into account here at all so that that I guess pretty much gives us what we would need to know so I think we still want to continue down the road that I'm going down though I want this to come out being centered around zero 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 because that gives us a prepared piece that we can then do what we want to do with so if you look at what's happening here we will be correctly centered around X because we are moving backwards along the x-axis we're going to use for drawing by our alignment point that keeps it aligned properly. We then move in y backwards along the world dim. We don't use the y-axis part at all, right? What we want to do now is say, if we're doing that sort of tilt, right? If that is what we're doing, we want zeros, we still want to center this thing around zero, 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 right? And then presumably it's it's the job of whoever's on the outside uh, to figure out how that alignment's going to work, right? So I realize that's a little janky. Let me draw this out for you because it, at least I think, makes sense in my head, but I don't know, other than a diagram, a good way to sort of show, show it to you uh, and, and let you know what I'm thinking. So for doing alignment, it, it, and again, this is really, this is really a very simple case all I'm trying to say with this is I want a way, why, why is there, why is the, oh, right, okay. Um, all I'm really trying to say is I want a way for us to, is there like a full screen? No, okay, sorry, getting distracted. What I'm trying to say is I want a good way of telling the exterior code, which I think is the place that the alignment should happen. And you know, it can use the utility function to do the alignment, but it should work on these two sprite things. I want them to both have concrete knowledge of the world space points they're trying to align, right? And so if I create uh, this, you know, the, the, the sprite values for upright, what they're essentially doing is they're saying, okay, you're giving me some point like here. And what I was doing is I was saying, well, all right, let's walk out about this far, right, depending on the height of the sprite, and then we'll tilt it backwards like that, right? So assuming that the camera is looking from here, you know, and that's going to be the sprite points. So I'm going to return min p is down here, oops, um, you know, and this part is the y-axis since we're looking from the side here, right? And, you know, if we wanted to draw it out more completely, it would be like, okay, uh, if we were looking from the camera's perspective, you give this point, it walks a little bit towards us and a little bit out, right? We get sort of this, we lie it back a little bit uh, and a little bit up like that, right? We output this corner point as min p, we output these axes, right? That's the y-axis, 
this is the x-axis, and these are scaled, right? So it includes that height value in there. That's what we're giving back. Now, when we do that, when we give back the, you know, these, these coordinates, what we were doing before is we were passing in the alignment point, which was this thing, and then we were actually giving back the world space. Like, here's exactly where to draw it. I took out that alignment point. And so now what I want to do is have 0, 0, 0 be the alignment point. So the coordinates you get back are just implicitly aligned around 0, 0, 0. So if you were to look at the sprite itself, like from the side on again, whatever the alignment point was that you were trying to align to, like say this, should actually be at 0, 0, 0 relative to where you're trying to align, right? That means this whole thing needs to get shifted down to line up properly with that alignment point and put it in the correct space, okay? So that means I actually don't want that shift, the Y shifting that was happening here. I don't really want that to be happening uh, in the interior. I want it to happen in the exterior code, okay? And I, that's the part I was trying to get to. So the reason I want it in the exterior code is because the exterior code needs to think about it uh, in order to figure out exactly how it should snap the points together, right? Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that was you know, clear in your head as I do these next few things. So that means this code here, right, which I do want to remember because it's good. It's the thing that actually worked, right? So we like that. Uh, but I don't actually want to do it here. What I want to do instead is I want to retain exactly this piece of uh, information, the thing that we were doing before, where we just create the alignment. I want to do that still, okay? So even though this is going to bring us back to our old crappy uh, bad way of sorting that isn't good, right? Um, that's okay because it's temporary, okay? All right, so now we should get exactly aligned. And we do, right? So, in a, and if I go in here and, and switch, to, um, uh, switch to a debug mode where I look at those points again, if I add a point on here, um, the two parent matching point, right? Whatever it is, so that's that red point there. Uh, if I look in here and I set the green point, the green point and the red point should always agree, right? And they do, right? So they're directly snapped one to the other, and that's what I wanted. So if I start from that and now say, okay, how do I construct that exterior code to snap these two things together in a way that makes sense, right? Well, excuse me, I apologize for blowing my nose. One of the consequences of having been sick. All right. Um, so if we take a look at what's happening here, what were we sort of doing before where we were just testing that code? Well, all we were really doing was saying, look, instead of actually producing the alignment point, let's just tilt this thing, let's just push it outward in Y so that we still stay on the same Z plane as we were, right? Just stay on the same Z plane. Well, it's pretty easy for me to make sure that we stay on the same Z plane as wherever I'm going to align to. All I would have to do is look at what the sprites outcoming Z values were for min p, and shift it back up, right? So if I want to do essentially the same thing that we were doing here, I can, I can just do that myself on the outside, right? So right here, exactly this operation that we were doing before, where I say, look, I want to shift this out, I can do, right, like this. And if you look at what's happening uh, with the y, axis there, this alignment would have been modifying the Y in some way, right? It definitely would have modified the Y of the alignment. And if we don't want the Y alignment to have been modified, you know, like if, if, we, if we don't want the Z or the Y or whatever to have changed, we can always also just cold set those, right? So maybe we want our Z to just always be, like we don't want our Z axis to have been altered. We want to base it exactly on where it was, right? We can also do anything we want to do uh, in that regard trivially, right? 
So on the outside, we can always fuss with what comes back uh, before we actually do any additional work. I don't, what is this bug, by the way? We saw this before. I wish we had it in a debug build. It's asking to find an alignment. And the align points for a bitmap info. Let's actually take a look at it. We saw it once before. I'd like to know what it is so we can fix it. Of course, the variable is optimized away. I'm going to look at the disassembly really quickly. What? You, I mean, of course you can show me the disassembly. Just show me where you, I mean, that's weird. Like, just show me where the code broke. Not, not that hard. All right, anyway, uh, so just looking here, what are we actually trying to access? So it looks like we're loading off of RSI. Um, it thinks that was the parent bitmap info that was put into RSI. Uh, it's looking six off of RSI and then trying to access it. So if we actually look at the source code there um, at this inline frame, so the align points P index, I guess we don't necessarily know what P index is, but maybe we can tell that from the disassembly as well. Uh, this is kind of a pain in the butt to have to go back and forth this way. Um, so in the disassembly here, we're doing a loop, right? So we're testing CLCL, update and render entities. Uh, we jump back to 13. Where is the actual loop here? What I say, we're comping. Can I, can I see, you know what? Here's what I'm wondering. Can I like see this at the same time? Is that, is that gonna be possible? Can we? So all I really want to do is I want to see this routine source code and then I want to look at this disassembly at the same time. But that apparently is like way past what you might want a debugger to do apparently. Can I do this? Okay. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, anyway, so I just want to look and see if I can deconstruct what's actually going on in here just to give it a little bit more con so I can sort of see exactly what's happening even the debugger won't tell me. Um, so if we take a look at here, what we're looking at, we've got a P index, it's looping uh, from zero to a known number, which is like 12 or something. I don't remember how many there are of this, right? Um, but that's all it's doing. So if we take a look at, at uh, if we try to reverse engineer what the assem you know, which assembly language goes with this thing, since the debugger doesn't know, um, but we can probably figure it out, if you look at what's going on in, in here, you can actually see right there that's a comp instruction. That's compare this register with this constant value. Um, and if we take a look right at what that is, that's OXOC. In, in, for some reason, assembly has the convention of writing H at the end of hexadecimal numbers, uh, whereas in C it's OX. But there's the 12, right? Which, if I remember correctly, is exactly how many... Um, uh, align points there are, right? Um, I don't know how to actually get... I'll just look it up myself. 
uh, what's this an HHA bitmap, I guess. Yeah. Um, so you can see there that that's, that's the 12. So I'm just using that, right? You can see how I'm doing this, just trying to explain how you reverse engineer the assembly so when the, when the debugger is a, a piece of junk. Um, because it always is. Uh, so, you know, trying to deconstruct where we are in this loop, you can see that comp with 12, that's probably going to be this loop condition because we were trying to go from zero uh, to 12. So that strongly suggests that this is the thing that's doing that loop, right? Let me go and see uh, if we go to 12. So when we do that, um, that comp, and we see whether it's 12 or not, that gives us an indication that that's this piece of code. It suggests that R9D, right, that is the register that would be holding the P index. And what I wanted to know is I wanted to know what the P index was. I'm assuming it's zero, but I just wanted to verify that fact for myself, right? Um, so if we look at what's going on here, we're gonna do an ink R9D and we're gonna see if we hit it. So that pretty much tells me that that's the loop. Um, let's take a look, it is zero. So it's our first time through this loop. That's all I wanted to know because I assumed it was, but didn't wanna you know, be wrong. Okay, so then we're coming to this line and the question is if we're looking at the zeroth one of this, right? then presumably this bitmap info structure is bogus. It's not a valid value, right? So what's going on there? RSI appears to be where that was loaded, I guess. Because this looks like the thing that was loading the bitmap info in, right? Probably. That seems to me to be the case. So in theory, if I do RSI on this, um, oh, and I'm apparently very wrong. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I, totally read that wrong. It's, sometimes I get confused because in the debugger they do stuff like this, which isn't, that's not assembly language. Like there's no, you know, there's no variables in it. So sometimes I get confused when I look at stuff like that and I'm like thinking it's doing something it's not. This is actually loading off of that pointer. So it's, it's loading something off of the parent bitmap info, if that's even accurate, which we don't know what that is. But so the thing they're loading is some number that's in there. Um, my guess is actually that may be because there's nothing in particular you would load out of there and you know adding six to it right what is that trying to do yeah I'm not sure so let's keep trying to parse this apart here and see what we're doing um, this right here is a clear, so it's putting zero into something. So this must be like in the preamble code here. We must be looking at some part, um, let me do go to source on this, there we go. We must be looking at something out here, I would guess. But I'll be honest, I'm not sure what. Let's look at that one more time. Well,
So I'm not exactly sure what it's doing here. It's doing a comparison against R15D, and I'm not sure. Let's take a look and see. It's doing a comparison against 3. That may be the thing that's testing the type. Right? So what it could be doing is saying, look, RSI... Okay, I wasn't wrong. So RSI is the offset that it's trying to load from. It probably just had a zero pointer to start with, right? And this right here was trying to get that, it was trying to get that portion of the value, right? So I'm assuming if we look at alignment point that it's six up for the type, right? So, right, you can see it doing its add six here. Where's that coming from? So I think what it's doing is it loads the base pointer, which is thinks it's pointing to the beginning of an alignment point. It's got two bytes for the first one, P percent, two bytes for the next one, two bytes for size. That's six bytes up, and there's the type. So this right here is saying, all right, let's, let's load RSI out of this. So it's got this, with this load right here. This load failed, so there was a zero in here. It then looked six up and tried to get the type out, right? Right here where it actually, I don't know what I accidentally just clicked. Right here where it tried to load that type, it is where it crashed. So that's why it was six. So RSI was the pointer. I wasn't wrong before. I was just not thinking. All right. So the question is, why is bitmap info being passed as a zero there, right? So if we unwind one level in the stack, we can see that that parent bitmap info was supposed to come from here. So, you know, whatever this bitmap info array uh, has in it, we were coming in here and asking for one that we don't have right? That does not exist. And so how does this happen, right? How has this happened to us? Can we access that array? Yes, we can. Uh, where is that array defined? Entity max piece count. So there's a couple of these, right? Who knows how many? But they're all probably zero. Yeah. Right. So we're just, uh, wait a minute. Nope, that's wrong too. That's just garbage. That's not telling me what I wanted at all. That's what I was trying to say. Um, so we look at these bitmap infos in the array. There's nothing in the array, right? It's just, it's empty. Um, and it gets up to, I don't know how many you admit, I think you're allowed to have four. So here's where the array ends. I don't remember what this value is. Uh, but so I think you're allowed to have four of those. So this is the array. Nothing has been filled into the array yet. And so what's happening is there's a zero, meaning, right, we're tying it to, uh, we're, we're, we're asking it to look up one of these things. Um, but we must be on zero, because otherwise we would have written them back, I would think. So when we're going to access these, like this, uh, we must be getting a parent align type that's non-zero on the first person, right? I mean, that's fundamentally what's happening. And I'm not sure why we're getting that. It seems like some kind of a bug in when, uh, you know, an entity we've constructed. Somehow we've constructed an entity with 
as its first thing. Um, something to attach. Unfortunately, I don't know how to really look into it in more detail than that to see who was responsible. Uh, looking at it, it's a gray tabby cat. So this is Molly Bean's fault. Uh, Molly is causing, causing the problem, right? But I'm not 100% sure how because the pieces of Molly should not have had that property. We can guard against this kind of a crash really easily and probably should, but before I do that, I would like to understand how we got a piece that did this in the first place. So I'm looking here at the bitmap, and you can actually see that its parent align type is very clearly zero. So the bitmap piece in question, when we did uh, get this bitmap info uh, should have given us back a parent align type. It should have given us, in fact, it's not even, we're not even talking about this. We're talking about this right here, right? So I don't understand how we were ever able to get inside that if statement. I'd like to go back to the disassembly. So we know that there should have been a test to make sure that this value was not zero, right? Uh, and because that's specifically not here, we don't care about this. Um, here's that source code. Here's this if statement, right? Bitmap piece dot parent align type. We should not be able to get into this code if that was not true, right? So you can see here that the last thing we tested was CL on CL, right? We were like CL equal to CL. That was the last thing we tested, right? Or I should say we asked the processor to compute the difference between CL and CL, which will set a bunch of flags that say, you know, it's greater than or it's whatever, right? Uh, we then did a jump to this effective address, uh, E5A, which is way down here. We then jumped all the way down here if, uh, based on the test, so what, what is this probably doing? Convert to XMM. I mean, that certainly could be consistent with this. We've got a lot of shuff PS and unpacking going on here. So yeah, I think that's right because all of this, shuff this shuffling and unpacking is probably taking the 16-bit values and turning them into floats, which you would need to do. So I, I can believe that this is actually doing that test. So the CLCL test is probably this, right? So what is CL? CL is zero. That's what we would expect it to be to not enter this routine, right? Where do we load that from? Let me try to get further confirmation that I'm looking at the right test here. Where did we get it? Um, yeah. Why am I not seeing that? You can imagine debuggers that were actually cool, right? You'd just like 
say where was CL loaded and it would just tell you. It knows, right? Um, it can just look back. I mean, across jumps, I guess it can't because it doesn't necessarily know if they were taken or not, but it could still tell you where the possible places it was nearby. So CL is just ECX though, now I think about it. So CL is just the quick way of saying, yeah, I'm, I'm bad with some of those uh, quick registers. So actually it's not that hard because uh, that's just gonna be this register extended register it's just it's just testing only the bottom uh part of it right so if you do just to make this a little clearer i know it's a little bit weird it's the intel naming thing is insane uh i don't program enough intel assembly to have it like quick in my head but basically like these registers right they started out being just you know uh 16 bits probably I'm guessing so they started out being like that big and then they went to being you know that big and then they went to being that big and you can still refer to the sub portions of them so if you say R a uh, you know RCX you're talking about the whole 64 bits if you say ECX you're only talking about the 32 bit value on the bottom and if you just say like CL, I guess, I don't know. So I don't remember how that works. If CL is only part of the register even further. But if you say that you're talking about um, the non E, non R version, then you're talking about just the bottom. So this is actually the part that we're looking at. This is the register that we're looking at here, I believe. And you can see that again, not being referred to as RCX, but it's being referred to as ECX here. It's trying to load this um, as just the bottom 32 bits of that, whatever's at that location, right? So in theory, RSP, because that I believe would be the stack there, right? Um, am I wrong about that? Uh, that shouldn't have changed. So no one probably touched that on our way down here. So RSP, I would assume, we can just look and see what's at that location to see what actually got loaded in, you know, into ECX uh, at this point. And then, and then it just gets tested. So I think this is the location we're looking for, maybe. Right, so that's the actual place that we're looking for. And we loaded um, a 32-bit value out of it, but we're only testing the bottom part of that anyway, which makes sense because the thing we were trying to test is only supposed to be 16 bits long. So if that was an unsigned short pointer, uh, what would it be? So it's saying that that was 259. Did I do that correctly? sure I did that because that shouldn't be right right because if we didn't touch ECX since then although does test here's the thing I don't remember what tests effect on its register actually is again just don't do nearly enough uh, assembly programming to remember stuff like that I almost always ignore uh, those kind of things we're so far down the rabbit hole at this point that I actually just want to know though so I'm gonna go ahead and do it. How do I get, I just wanna get back to the desktop here. So let's take a look. 
I'm going to go ahead and pop over the architecture reference panel. It's never too late to learn assembly language, folks. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Um, so, you know, we've got the complete reference. Let's just find it. In fact, I guess I can just click on it in here. It's usually the way I do it. So if we just scroll down here and take a look, um, that's V. Oh, I opened the wrong one. That starts at V. I need a little bit back. There we go, M through U. Um, so if I scroll through here and find the test instruction, So I don't see anything that would suggest that it would write back to the sources. I mean, I don't know, do you? So if you look at here, <clears throat> you can see the pseudocode for what uh, Intel is saying the test instruction would do. It says, hey, we're gonna compute uh, the and of the two things we, you know, we gave you. Uh, and then we're going to set some flags, right, based on that. And it doesn't suggest, at least as far as I can see, um, that source 1 and source 2 would ever get touched, right? Um, it, it should leave the value unadulterated, right? Um, so unless I'm reading that wrong, then I'm just confused when we're doing the test CLCL, it seems like that should leave it. Now, what I don't know is maybe because it's referred to as CL, it's clear as part of the register because it, the top part is not referred to as part of the CL. Because like, let's suppose we took a look at this, right? Of course, even if that were true, you'd still see three there. So what I don't understand is if this is actually the assembly that occurred, what am I doing wrong? We did a mov, oh, well, okay. So I guess mov ZX, we should double check what that does. Maybe there's something special about that uh, that I'm forgetting. But if this is the last time we touched it, I suppose RBP and RSP could point to the same thing and this overrode it. I mean, that's the only other thing it could be, right? Neither of those two things has been touched, right? Ah, uh, nope. Here's the problem. You see it? So ECX did get reloaded. So when we tested CL versus CL, it uh, obviously wasn't zero. Um, and what we're getting here is it's just, it got overwritten by this. So this may be correct, right? This may actually be what was in that location. And it could be that what was in that location was actually 103, right? Um, was actually 259. And that 259 would cause us to enter this loop. So the question is, how the heck is 259 what's in there, right? Why are we getting something where the first thing has a 259 in it? So if we again look at the hexadecimal for that, what would, is 259 even a valid value? Like, doesn't make sense, right? And so if you look at what should be in an align point type, right? Because that's, we're, we're looking at parent align type here, right? You would expect it to be something like, eight zero zero and then you know maybe the three like one two three it could be right base of neck could be totally something that would be in there right i don't think it should be but you know zero one two three that could be a value this bit getting set we should never have done that right there's no valid alignment point that has a one in that location. So this looks very suspicious. <coughs> but again, unless I'm mistaken, uh, the actual disassembly that we're seeing there, uh, how do I actually go to, there we go. 
Uh, that disassembly that we're seeing sure looks like that's what was in there. So again, let's do our due diligence and just say, if this was what we moved in there, uh, and this code right here is the only thing that could have interceded, as far as I can tell, uh, because nothing else actually did anything. Uh, let's just make sure that RSP and RBP aren't pointing anywhere near each other. I don't see why they would be, but let's just see. <laughs> uh, they're not going to make it easy on us, are they? So it turns out that RSP and RBP are actually <laughs> are actually like right next to each other. Okay, the plot thickens. If you ever wanted to see half, having to dig through some assembly language code uh, to, to figure out where your bug comes from, well, you're getting a tree today because they're making it hard on us. I always like doing this because it's educational for me. Like I said, I just, I never did any uh, x64 assembly language programming. Uh, and so it's all always educational, right? And little things that you learn to do like, oh, right, you know, um, remember to look for the different versions of the register that you wouldn't be used to doing on other architectures necessarily. Every time you get burned by something like that, it's like sticks in your head better. So you'll be quicker next time around, right? So I don't know, I, I always find it to be educational to do. I mean, it would be great if you didn't have to do it because the debugger actually could show you this stuff in release mode. But you know, uh, if, if, if wishes were unicorns, uh, we'd all join the circus as they say. So anyway, um, back to our story. Let's see if we actually, did we have a problem with overwriting here where it may have obscured the actual value that was originally in there because that one interceding right isn't actually super far away. Um, so that's a bit of an issue. These are the two locations that we're talking about here. Let's look at what they actually are. So we have RSP plus OX59 uh, and we have RBP minus OX60. Those are the two locations that we're looking at. This mob is moving XMM1. Uh, and XMM1 is just a 128-bit value, right? XMM1 is one uh, of the SIMD registers. And exactly this in this analogous fashion to the way that the uh, processor got added to, the XMM ones are the ones that were 128 bits wide. The YMM ones are when you're 256, and then the ZMM ones are when you're. Yeah, I don't. I don't really remember. They're not on here. But um, so if you want to talk about the lower part of one of these registers, uh, the 128 bits part, you call it XMM zero. If you want to talk about the full uh, width, it's YMM0. Or if you're on AVX 512, I think it's ZMM0 to do the fun. But I don't have uh, X, I don't have AVX 512 on this machine. This chip doesn't. Uh, the Core i7 7700K didn't have AVX 512, uh, if I remember correctly. So any, so that's why you can't even turn it on in here. All right. So back to our story. So we're writing a 128-bit value, that's 16 bytes, right? Uh, we're writing 16 bytes to this location uh, right here, RBP minus 60H. And so I'm wondering, would that have in interfered uh, with what's here, right? That's, that's all I wanted to know. And so if we look back at this watch window, what we could say is, well, RBP minus 60 plus 16 would be here uh, and reading out of here, those addresses are close, but they don't overlap, right? There's plenty of distance between them. You can see this, uh, you know, well, I can even do this for you. Q 
Here's that pointer. And here's this one. Uh, so you can see that they're actually separated by quite a few bytes, right? There's a, there's, there's a significant distance between the two of them. Uh, and so we're not really gonna have, uh, you know, anything close to a, six, a single 16 byte write is not going to uh, create a, a problem. All right, so again, bringing us back to what we were talking about here, again, this is the part of the code that we're looking at. So we loaded it here. Uh, we did a write from a register to a part that was close by, but not overlapping as far as I can tell, because we don't touch either RSP or RBP anywhere down through here that I can see. Um, make sure that's right. Because RSP, this is why I say these are RSI and RSP are not the same registers. It's not a nomenclature thing like the other ones, right? Yeah. So those are not interfering, uh, being interfered with at all through here, as far as I can see anyway. Yeah. So that means that unless I'm mistaken, 259 somehow got in there, right? We somehow got a 259 uh into that bitmap piece and I just don't understand where that would have come from. Uh, this value right here is 259. And so, you know, do we have some kind of a, of a, of a bug with the way that we're doing these bitmap pieces where we're like, you know, maybe there's a, a weird bug somewhere that actually writes 259 to that thing. Um, and I'm not sure where, uh, you know, it's loaded out of here, obviously. Um, but yeah, I just don't know. I don't know where that would have come from. It makes me want to put some guarding in here to look at these particular things and see if we can catch it a little earlier on to see where that's coming from. Right, so like to get some idea of when 259 got stuck into the bitmap piece in the first place, because where did it come from? What makes it even more confusing is remember, this actually isn't part of the art stuff. This is actually just where we create those snap together pieces that's the only place that we set that information up. Um, so for example, let's say I, actually I guess I didn't really close that down. But let's suppose we go back to where that sort of stuff happens, right? And I don't know, um, I think it's in here, right? So when we actually create this stuff, uh, when we create these pieces, We've got this connect piece call, and then a connect piece call like sets some stuff up, right? It says, oh, uh, you know, truncate this stuff down and stuff it in here like this or whatever, right? Um, all right, so looking at that actually now, those are eight bit values. That's particularly interesting too. So CL was really just loading the eight bit value. Oh, look at that. All right, so actually, 209 isn't weird, I, uh, I'm sorry, 203, uh, what was it, uh, 103 hex was fine. That actually means that someone just set the low thing to be uh, in this parent align type. It was setting it right because uh, it was loading, what we were actually seeing there was it loading the next thing in memory, right? And it wouldn't have loaded that because, well, it wouldn't have used that because it was testing CL to CL. 
So it would have only used the low 8 bits, I believe. So that means it's not necessarily garbage. It's a totally valid value in the totally wrong place, right? So that's interesting. So now the question becomes, how did that end up, right? I mean, let's, let me just reset that one more time. So I know there's a lot going on there. So let me reset that one more time. In parent align type, which is set in here, how did we end up having the first thing, the first piece in the entity say that it was supposed to have a parent align type? non-zero. How did it happen? Right? That's the question. So, one possibility is like we're not clearing them properly. We thought they would all be zeros at the start, but they weren't or something. That seems unlikely. And the reason that that seems unlikely is there are only three valid values that that thing could have taken on, and it was one of the valid values. If it wasn't, if it was an, a non-cleared memory problem, you would expect it to be one of the 252 other things it could have been randomly, you would have thought it would have been one of those. More likely, right? So it's a low probability thing. We should check it, but it's low probability. More possible is somebody is calling connect piece weirdly or something strange is happening there. Now, if we're right that it was the tabby, I mean, if it was, Right? If it's Molly's fault, uh, then here in, in add cat, this is where the problem would have been. So this add piece here, where we add the body and the head, somehow... Uh, somehow this code was producing something erroneous. Right? Now, when we call add piece, like here, uh, what are we doing each time? Well, we assert that we haven't overflowed the number of pieces. We didn't hit that assert, and we assumed that the assert would have fired. So we have entity pieces plus entity piece count plus plus, right? So we grab a piece out of this array. They pretty much have to go in order, right? I mean, how could they not? So the body will come before the head. The body's piece zero, head's piece one. When we call connect piece to world, which is down here, We're doing an HHA align none as the parent piece align type. Not sure why we don't just set it to zero. So that's a little odd. But let's, I mean, I'll double check it, but I, that's pretty much not a problem for us, right? Because that's always going to be zero. So, I mean, even if it wasn't cleared, this call should have done the work, right? There shouldn't have been any way 
for that to have um, this would have overwritten whatever was there with a zero because safe truncate to u8 uh, is literally just going to u8 cast this value the value is zero so this bitmap parent align type would also be zero and the entity as a result should just be what it is, right? Uh, is it place cat? No. It's add cat. Oh, right, I can't jump to it because of the, uh, the parser doesn't understand the kind of, uh, yeah, long story on that one. No matches for add cat. There it is. Um, so I'm still thoroughly stumped. How is it possible that we add body as zero, head as one, we connect a piece to the world which should have cleared this, and then we've got this connect piece here that's operating on the head. Let's make sure that connect piece doesn't do something weird there, I guess. So here's connect piece. There's only one version of it that I can see. In here we say, we're gonna look at the child bitmap. So we're looking at the one that's off of the head. So we're not even touching this body one here. Uh, we grab the parent piece. Again, doesn't, that's not gonna make any difference because it's not the one, we're not writing this back to the one in question, which is the zeroth, you know, the zeroth entry. So who even cares how this function works? We just do not care even a little bit. Uh, I, I literally can't see it yet, any way that that would have affected it. So somehow, although I don't see any way for it to actually happen, we are getting an alignment value that is non-zero into the first piece in our entity, unless our debugging of the assembly code was way off base. Uh, and the value we're getting, we actually know what the value was too, right? It was one, so it was uh, HHA align default was the parent alignment. So it's like it wrote the one, like if we, if I had to make up a bug that doesn't look like it's actually there, <clears throat> it looks like it wrote the parent align type, uh, HHA align none. Instead, it wrote the child type into the parent align type, right? Like if it wrote, if these two lines had been swapped, that would be the bug, right? I mean, that's what the bug, that would have been the bug. But they're not swapped, so... So I don't really know. I guess because I don't have any better ideas, should we go ahead and look at the add cat disassembly in release mode to see what it actually does in case maybe there's something we're just not thinking about? So here's the disassembly. I don't know why it's not sure which one I want there, but whatever. Um, so here's the disassembly of that call, right, of, of, of adcat. Uh, and if I just look through it here where I'm sort of stepping, um, you know, let's take a look at the place where we add those pieces, I guess. So what I will say is I don't see any calls in here, right? So there is a little bit of a concern in my head now because I'm like, all right, so it decided to inline the call to connect piece to world and the call to connect piece. 
it inlined both of those, right? Uh, and in fact, also, I guess it inlined the call to add piece as well, right? Here's it doing, um, in fact, if we take a look back here, uh, here's add piece, right? So, EDX4, so here's it doing the assertion, right? Here, uh, we're, this right here, I believe is it just filling in, let me try to show you here, filling in this, right? I believe, uh, yeah. So it's running on a registers, I think, uh, to pass these. So it's putting them on the stack because they're structs, right? I think, don't quote me on this. It might actually be filling in default parameters too, I don't know. So we're going through here though, pretty straightforward, right? We're just checking the assertions. I mean, I, yeah, you know, I mean, I'm not gonna follow this all the way through. It would take a while. Here's the second add piece call. Uh, and now we're down into the connector calls, right? In theory. So yeah, all right. Looking at this a little bit more closely here, let's see. What are we doing here? So it looks like, hold on a second. So it looks like um, this test here was probably this assertion, I'm guessing. Uh, yeah, you can see the assertion here would have written to the zero address to cause the crash, right? Uh, so remember our assertion just writes to the zero page so it halts the process immediately if it happens. So then here we were saying, all right, uh, let's go ahead and write the rest of this stuff out. Um, so it's this is where we would be doing that. Um, I would assume, assuming this actually didn't get rearranged too much, uh, but let's take a look. So R11W, here we go, uh, R11W, and then one are the two things that it's writing out. If we look at the structure uh, of these bitmap pieces in Entity Visible Piece, uh, here's where those are created. The reserved value is obviously zero. Uh, the parent piece in our case is also gonna be zero here or one in the other, uh, as far as the other one. And the parent align type, child align type, that's the sort of thing that we're looking at here, how that's actually getting added in there. Um, but yeah, so if you look at this, it looks like the way that that's working in here is it sort of knows exactly what it wants to write uh, into this part of the struct. I don't know if we've got... Um, course not um, the ability to inspect it much here's add cat uh, yeah it doesn't know anything Does it no entity it does uh, so if we take a look at the pieces here uh, here's them getting uh, structured so if we take a look inside uh, the pieces here and we look at the bitmap part of this, right? 
So the first one is supposed to get set to zero here, zero here, and zero here, but one should get set right here. And if you look at the disassembly, that looks like exactly what's going to happen. Uh, where do I get that window back? Here it is. This is setting the first part to zero, so that's setting these uh, parts to zero here, I believe. And then this part right here is putting that one in place. So I think when we step over this, that should go. Yeah, right. So that set it up exactly as we think that it should, um, which is great. I mean, quote unquote, right. Now looking for weird bugs that might be in this code, I guess. So R11W, I mean, I don't know where the last time that got set was. Here's one place. I guess I couldn't tell you, man. Like, where is that getting set? This just clears it. Right? But I guess, now I think about it, it can only ever be zero. So I guess that's just fine. That would always be correct, right? So as long as R11 doesn't get changed again, that would be fine. Do we ever touch it again? We don't. We, we do a mob here, which is interesting. This is writing zero to zero. This is writing zero to here, which, but that just might be because it happened to know it had a zero, so it used it for clearing. I don't know, man. So that seems like it would pretty reliably write out exactly what we think it should, right? Um, I don't have a lot of explanation for that. So that looks fine. I guess I should double check again, though, before we uh, say that that all looks fine, that, you know, what happens after that. So here, you know, when we're going through uh, to figure out the next part of it, we've got the connect piece call. Uh, if we, can I get that to go to the source code? Yeah. So here it needs to do, right, um, this subtraction where it's got to figure out what index this thing is actually lining up for the parent piece. Um, it doesn't really matter, right? It's doing a shift to figure that out because it knows that this happens to be 16 bytes long, right? So that's how it's doing the divide there. Again, I don't think any of this matters uh, because it's not going to write to the person who we care about anyway. Uh, it's doing a jump here. This is the assertion, again, that it left in, uh, which is fine. And then it's, uh, yeah, it looks like it's just... Again, let me just, I don't know why it keeps moving us away from that source. I wanted to see this source. Uh, go to source code, there we go. So in here, we're looking at this uh, bitmap parent piece. It's just looking to make sure, I guess we didn't, uh, yeah, when we're doing that connection, we're saying, <clears throat> make sure that the thing we're connecting to is earlier than we are. which again seems fine. So I don't know, uh, this is a real nasty bug somewhere because I don't actually see uh, where the bug is coming from here. We can't repro it, right? Meaning we only get it once in a while and we don't really know why we're getting it. Does it have something to do with code reloading? Like, does it happen when I do this or something? 
No. So I don't know. Uh, I guess, you know, that was a sufficient looking into of it, right? We didn't cheese out. We looked for it pretty hard. So I think what we're going to have to do is possibly add some more code to help us look for it, I guess, in the future. Uh, or hope we get a lucky break and get an easier to debug case down the line. But I don't see anything amiss in there, and I don't understand how that thing could have happened exactly. We can guard against it pretty easily, meaning inside the actual entity code, all we would have to do here is just make sure uh, that we don't actually ever do this. Like, you know, we could even move this code up above this line, and then we'd be fine, right? Uh, because we would just look at our own bitmap info and that would, you know, wouldn't crash, right? But it's still wrong, you know what I mean? Like, it's unclear to me. I'd like to figure out why we're ever getting this because this should never be able to actually happen. Um, we can certainly make the bug occur a little bit further upstream, but not enough to actually matter that I can think of anyway. Uh, which is to say that when we do this parent align type bit here, when we get in here, we could just say, hey, uh, just so we know, let's make sure we never do this on a piece index uh, that's zero, right? Um, so I, I don't know, right? I don't really know what to make of it. Uh, it's, it's pretty weird. Uh, but that's it, uh, and I don't know. I don't know how to track it down further. We'll go ahead and go to the Q and A, um, and I guess we'll finish up what we were doing today. We'll finish that up tomorrow. Uh, I'm glad we took a, a look into that to see if there was anything obvious wrong. But I didn't. That investigation turned up really not much. Um, and so, if anyone has any, uh, while that was happening, obviously you guys were watching. If you had any particular avenue you think I missed, tell me, you know, uh, tell me what it was. Because I'd be interested to know if there was anything that I didn't pursue there that looked like it could have been fruitful. But I don't, uh, I don't have, I don't have anything off the top of my head that I think we could have done that would have helped us, uh, in release mode, you know, the debugger doesn't give you much help, so you're pretty much reading on your own. Um, yeah, I got nothing. How do you like the progress of HH so far? Um, I like everything except the lighting. Uh, I'd like to do a pass on the lighting and fix that. But I like, I really like where we ended up. I like how everything works now. It's pretty good. It's the first time I've ever tried a mixed mode game. I don't, you know, uh, it's not something I do. I don't do like 2D, 3D stuff. I usually just do 3D. Um, or straight 2D. So it was really interesting uh, going through all of that. And I feel like what we ended up with was pretty novel. I've never seen anything that quite does exactly what we do. Uh, and so I feel like we found some pretty cool stuff. I don't know. I really like the way it looks. Um, and uh, seems like a pretty solid engine so far. It suffers from the fact that not very much time has been put into it, you know. Um, engine work is is hard work. It's long hours, and it's like you know you're, a lot of stuff uh, you have to do, and so it's pretty truncated compared to what I would like to spend on the engine. You know, I'd like to spend at least four times as much time as we've spent on stream for the same amount of code that we've had, just refining things, making them more 
robust and cleaning them up and all that sort of stuff that I would normally have plenty of time to do for an engine of this complexity, which is not that high. Um, but, you know, uh, given the limitations of the series and what I can do with the way that we set it up, I, I think it's delightful. Uh, I would like to, f I would like to fix the lighting though. The lighting is just not where it needs to be. Um, it looks cool. It's too slow. Um, and so, uh, I think that's the last thing that we, I have some ideas about it. That's the last thing that I'm like, yeah, that's not really solved, right? Um, everything else looks and feels great in terms of the architecture. And the things that we have to do are more just like straight to do items. I don't see a lot of uh, unknowns in there, but the lighting needs, needs to be improved. So. Will you add 3D printers as collision proxies? We already have them. You've mentioned in the past you climb with former exercise. Have you seen free solo yet? I have. Yes. That stuff is nuts. Now related to the problem with the handle subject of assembly, do you have a chance to look at the burst compiler demo from Unity's GDC 2019 keynote? No. I mean, you know, Unity just doesn't isn't something I need to follow because I don't use it. So I don't really care what they're doing most of the time. So I don't follow it. I certainly don't care about the burst compiler because, well, I mean, why would I care about the burst compiler? I think it's good though, because for people who have to use Unity, which is a lot of people, uh, I think it's good that they are trying to provide ways of giving you access to uh, actual speed focused code right? Um, because it will enable, I would think, it will enable people who are programming in Unity to do things they couldn't have done that are like custom to their game, you know, that they really couldn't have done before without like making a, a plugin, right? Uh, where they have to go write like the C++ code themselves, which is, you know, the whole point of Unity is that you're not having to do that. Like the whole point is that you don't have to go do all the standard game development stuff. You can just use the stuff they've already built. But, you know, there are specific things that you need to do in your game that are specific to your game. And you don't want to have these handcuffs on you where you can't uh, get reasonable performance out of it. So I think the burst compiler is very good and I hope it is successful at like uh, giving people the ability to stay in the like the confines of Unity, so they don't have to learn a whole new environment and programming language and all these other sorts of things, but still learn. They can learn a few things about how computers work and how to do things quickly, and then access that power through a standard Unity, um, you know, interface. So I, I think that is just fundamentally good uh, and will have a positive impact on this, you know, the, the types of games you can make in Unity that maybe in the past, would, you know, you wouldn't really have been able to make certain kinds of games because the performance would have been a limiting factor. Now you, you know, now you can maybe consider those games, whatever that sort of space looks like, right? Miblo, a couple of days late, uh, but now that we're hopping in Z, how about adding water so the hero can go swimming? Um, I'm not averse to it, but uh, you know, the, I'll be honest, the thing is, I don't know that we really want to take the time to do water rendering, because water rendering is kind of its own whole thing, uh, and just based on like time constraints, right? Like, you know, I don't know that we want to go down that road. So, uh, 
I would say that might be more left as an exercise for the reader, you know. Um, it seems to me somewhat straightforward how you would go about adding something like that. So I think most people would be able to do it on their own. Um, and the really big challenge is how do you draw it, right? Because you want the water to look nice. You want it to look like water. Um, and the question is how do you make it respond, you know, when the when the hero, like, jumps on in, you know, and, and do, do you do some water simulation to try to make it look like it's rippling out and, you know, those sorts of things. And then what do you do about, you know, do you want to try and reflect things in it, you know? So it's a pretty, you know, water is a bad thing to add to a game if you don't want to go down kind of a pretty big rendering rat hole. Because um, it's, its, it's its whole own thing. Now you could, if you just want cheap water, that's not so hard, right? It's just a translucent plane you stick in there. Uh, and that's not so bad. So, you know, we could do really lousy water, but, you know, I'd probably rather just not do water. Not a question. Hi, Casey. On Monday, I'm starting my first day of work at a medium-sized game studio after working for Microsoft for a few years. Just want to say thanks to you, among others, for the inspiration and education that made this career change possible. Right? Awesome. You're the second person today who says that. It's good to see so many people are, uh, you know, finding new directions thanks to, you know, some increased exposure to low-level programming stuff. Tag. It was a good uh, demo on about how a bug can mess up the schedule and get you two hours of intro, but sadly nothing. Yeah, I mean, that's... And I guess the other thing that I would say is that's why I think debuggers are really underrated. I mean, a lot of that time that we spent there was time that a machine could have answered the questions, right? Like, I wasn't doing anything superhuman related. Not superhuman, but that was super related to humans. Um, most of the inquiries that I performed are ones that a machine could have performed with very limited direction, right? And so better debuggers would save a lot of time for low-level programmers. Debuggers right now are just really lousy. And so improving debuggers and making it so that you don't have to spend very much time to debug release mode code, which is where a lot of bugs happen, um, would be a pretty major improvement. And like most of the two hours of today, well, not two hours, because we spent an hour before doing that. So it was an hour, but an hour, a good hour was spent mostly doing things that could have been automated, right? Um, and so I feel like, you know, I would really like to emphasize just how bad the debugging situation is. Um, we weren't doing things that really needed to be done by a person. Those were things that could have been done by a computer, um, but that we just have to do manually for no real reason. Just poor debuggers, right? Um, So there's a lot of questions here, and I'm not sure how many we really want to get into, but we'll start with the first one uh, from Bulminator. Hey, Casey, the way you think, teach how to think about matrices has helped me understand the transformation pipeline a lot better, but there's one thing I think I'm missing. At one point, you put the camera coordinates into clip space. I was wondering how you 
scale world units to make sure things aren't huge on screen. Um, <clears throat> so I guess I'm not really sure how to answer that question. Um, In order to give you a really good, complete answer, I think it probably would help, I guess, if I actually brought the matrix up. Uh, so this is the perspective projection uh, call that we're, um, that we're actually using in, in Handmade Hero, right? Um, and if you look at the way that this matrix is structured, what you can see is the scale is given by two fundamental values, A times C and B times C, right? And you can see them right here, right? In our case, we fix A at 1.0. Uh, which means that we're sort of, I don't know how to put it, but like X coordinate primal, like we're basically saying we're going to adjust the scale in Y of the clip transform to account for the aspect ratio, right? Because we're creating a unit cube for our clip space uh, and we're choosing, t we have to either compress X or compress Y differently to make sure that we have the same aspect ratio as our screen, right? So hopefully A and B make sense there. Neither of those two is scaling anything, right? A is 1.0, so it doesn't scale anything at all. And B is only applying a scale such that our unit cube properly captures the fact that uh, the final height of the screen, the final height that we want to see of the world, you know, of that slice through the world, is wider than it is tall, right? And you can see that it's a little bit paradoxical. It's width over height that we're putting in there, right? Um, instead of height over width, which is what you would expect if you were doing the other way around. But remember, it's because this is the compression, not the expansion. So we're going the opposite direction as we would if we were trying to, we're not trying to compute the height from the width, because if we were, it would be the other way around. Instead, what we're trying to do is compress the height into the same space as the width, right? So that's why the ratio is flipped from what you might intuitively think. Okay, so these two values do not scale the world at all. They're just trying to make sure that we end up with a cube that matches, the, so we don't get warping, right? That matches the display. Because after this transform occurs, we're going to multiply the outcoming values by the number of pixels in X and Y, and those numbers are different. So this is accounting for that difference in scale on the other side. Might be another way to think of it. Okay, so what that leaves you with is the C value, this right here. And that C value is the thing that does all of the scaling. That's the focal length of the lens, right? Um, and that C value is precisely the thing that gives you the scaling that you're talking about. So the focal length of a lens uh, and this is not exactly true because obviously we're not really simulating a lens per se. This is a kind of idealized like pinhole camera kind of a thing, right? But <clears throat> it is precisely that focal length of the pinhole camera lens that determines how big the world appears on the camera's 
film back. So that is what that is, right? So that's the thing to answer your question. That right there, that focal length value is what determines how big or small the world appears on the picture of it that you are taking, right? Um, I don't know if there's any really better way to put it than that. Does that make any sense? It might not have, but... And again, it, it may seem a little bit, um, that may not have been a complete enough explanation. So, you know, it's an important question that you're asking. This is, a, this is an important question. Uh, most, uh, you know, 99% of all programmers who've ever used a pers perspective projection matrix don't know how it works. So it's good that you're asking this question because most people don't ask this question and, and they just, you know, uh, never understand what's going on. So <clears throat> just to be a little bit more concrete and maybe this diagram will help a little bit. So in a normal camera, right, you've got a thing called the lens assembly uh, and the lens assembly is some nonsense that's got like all these different lenses and crap in it, right? And so the world is out here somewhere you know what I mean, uh, that we're looking at. And what's actually happening with those lenses is all kinds of light bouncing around is happening in here. And then eventually it gets to a film back and you know it exposes some part of the film back or the CCD in the case of a digital camera nowadays. And that's how we get the image, right? And so normally when we talk about things like the effective focal length of a lens, we're talking about something like this and like, okay, we're not doing that. So the word focal length here is not really talking about any kind of real world analog of a real lens assembly. But it's not that far off because what we are actually talking about is the following thing for a pinhole camera. Here is my pinhole camera, right? And here is some crap in the world, okay? So let's suppose that I take something in the world, like this ball, and you are asking the, the question, how large is this ball going to appear in my game? Because there's a world with 3D coordinates and all this other stuff in it, but then I'm looking at a screen. So what, you know, how do those two things correlate together? One's like a flat, 2D display surface where things have an actual size. I can take a ruler out and measure it on my actual screen. It has a real size in the real world we're viewing it in. But there's also this fake world in the game and we're saying stuff like one unit is one meter. How, you know, what, I don't understand, right? What you're saying, like, I don't get how these things are related. Um, and so the answer there is that, well, okay, the focal length of the lens in this case, what we're saying is how far from the aperture, right? The thing that the light is passing through, how far back are we going to get to the actual, you know, uh, uh, to the actual film back, right? And, you know, so the place where the light crosses and inverts, uh, there's two ways that you can measure that. Uh, I don't actually, rem you know, these are the kind of things that I'm too old. They flick out of my head. I know on the days when I write the code for this stuff, cause I go relook it up and make sure I've got it right. So I'm not naming things improperly um, in my actual code, but then, you know, I'm sorry. So this is gonna be slightly wrong. Um, in a real camera, right? There's an aperture that light comes through cause you're getting more than a pinhole, right? It's not a pinhole. And then there's a place where the light crosses. So that, you know, you've got a single emanation point. Light is coming out to the lens. It's getting redirected by the lens. It's crossing and then it hits, right? The film back. And, you know, 
like my brain just never remembers do you do, is that the focal length or is that the focal length right it's probably that one i don't remember it doesn't matter for our cases because these aren't real values we're not simulating a real camera but if you were you'd better get it right because you're gonna be off by two right it's you're gonna be two x you're twice as large or half as big depending on which way you got it wrong. You know what I mean? So you do need to know what that actually means if you're doing a real camera. We're not. Um, so the point is, this distance, whether you measure it by half or by whole, this distance is what determines how big the world will look, in a sense, right? Because when we actually project this thing through here, the pinhole is actually the place where these things would flip around, right, onto here. And the further back we move this thing, right, the further they would diverge. Does that make sense? Um, so it's not an accident that we called that the focal length. It's essentially measuring how far back you're putting that camera plate in the imaginary camera that we've created to photograph this world with, right? But, you know, um, I don't know if that helps you picture a little bit more what's going on in there uh, with that, that focal length um, value. So, uh, yeah. Um, I don't think if that makes any sense. It's still not a very good explanation because the intuition there was like, okay, so I move this thing back further, but you know, this thing gets bigger as well. Um, so maybe I can draw this diagram a little bit better. Uh, I don't know if any of this is helping. It's probably not. Um, so let's suppose that we're talking about a nice 90 degree FOV here, right? Uh, and let's say the camera is pointing this way. Okay. So here are the bounds of the camera when I'm looking out, right? And so I'm creating a film back here. Uh, and then I'm also going to create another film back here. It's further back, right? And then I'm going to create something that's that big. And I'm going to pass it through as delicately as I can. Oops. All right, so let's say it's about that big. Okay. Um, so yeah, like if we look at what actually happens here when we've got these sort of things, um, and you know, like I said, it's unfortunately not the best. Um, but you know, I. Uh, If we try to imagine what's happening here with, if we literally just made these as, uh, as our, uh, I'm not sure what the right way to say this would be. Um, if you just imagine these things continuing to kind of uh, extend out as far as you can, uh, I just need a better, I need a better way to draw these diagrams because this is just, I'm trying to show that those triangles end up being,
right? Okay, so as best as I can actually do this, right? These are gonna be similar triangles, right? So each one of these, the ratio should be the same, right? I guess is what I was trying to say. So the reason I was saying like, this is not a particularly compelling way to actually view the focal length effect is because the diagram doesn't include the actual part that makes this not produce the exact same result, right? Whereas this diagram does include the thing that makes it not produce the exact same result, which is the fact that the aperture size is the same, but the focal length part is changing. <clears throat> well, that's not a particularly useful way to say it, I guess, but you know, not sure what else to, to put on there. Um, so really, really what you have to imagine happening is this pinhole <clears throat> has collapsed two parts of this camera down into one part of the camera. So this part is actually changing independently from this part. Uh, and I don't know how to draw that in a way that makes better sense than what I've, what I've drawn. Um, if I was to draw the real version of it, I think it becomes a little bit clearer, right? Because you can see what I mean by, I have an aperture that lets light in, right? I have a point in the world that I'm projecting, right? And you know, maybe I've got, if I've got two of those points or something, right? Uh, and they're both kind of doing something that looks a little bit like this. And they're getting redirected from here through a focus, right? And there's the focus point. From there, the film back gets moved forwards or backwards, right? This point doesn't change. So the further back you move this fixed size thing, right? The more you can see how this would change size. So the right way to do it on this diagram would be enforce a fixed size. <clears throat> <clears throat> Maybe this is the way I should have drawn it first, right? <clears throat> so assume this fixed size here, <clears throat> right? Because it is going to be a fixed size, right? The thing that we produce, that unit cube, is the unit cube. That's how big it is, right? So maybe this is the best way to draw the diagram i don't know it's like i think about it in these terms nowadays because i'm used to having to simulate real camera effects <clears throat> so when you go to a pinhole camera i'm not sure the best way to like visualize what's going on in my head i think of it like this diagram but we don't have that part of this diagram <clears throat> So maybe a better way to think it would be if this is a fixed size, the reason that we call it focal length is because you could imagine moving this fixed size plate backwards. And as you move that fixed size plate backwards, right, this is going to take up more room <clears throat> on the back of the plate and get bigger, right? Does that make sense? So as the focal length gets further back, this will get bigger. So that's why when you look on here, these clip space coordinates as they come out, the focal length is just a straight up scale. And it's a scale because it's effectively just taking these and pushing them outwards. As the focal length gets bigger, they will get larger, right? I don't know if that makes any sense. Um, and so that's like effectively what you're doing in a compressed pinhole camera so that these things don't actually really exist. But you can think of the, you know, you can still think of this as the negative one, positive one bounds of the clip space, right? And so that focal length is effectively changing where this one, one plane 
is like slid up versus your your camera boundary there, right? Versus the well, not versus your camera boundary, versus the world uh, that you're looking into, right? So you're you're changing how this fixed divide, because remember the divide doesn't change, right? The divide is happening in you know proportional to the near far clip plane stuff for the z coordinate and just relative to w directly for the actual values uh, that come out, right? So as far as the, pro the projection is concerned, you can see it doesn't care. It's not even looking, right, at those values. So it really is just, this is fixed, and you're just figuring out where that focal length film back uh, is placed. Does that make sense? Um, so, again, I have a really hard time explaining it, and I apologize for that, because I just don't think in terms of pinhole cameras much anymore, but that might be the best way to say it, right? Is that you're effectively sliding the film back closer to the pinhole or further from the pinhole by adjusting that focal length parameter. Sorry to take so long to get there. Uh, zero PBM says, I think in a pinhole camera, the focal length is zero and the focal point is the actual pinhole itself. Um, yeah, that sounds about right. You've like moved those two things to be coincident. Yeah, so you know what? The, this phrase here... It's really, you know, that value is really the distance of the film back from the pinhole. I, right? Do you know what I mean? And so I feel like we just named that poorly. We went through lots of iterations of this, and we probably just kept this value called focal length. Maybe it was the focal length at one point. It's definitely not now. <clears throat> but a better way to think of it is, like, that's the distance the film back has moved from the pinhole which would be the point, the, the focal point, I guess. Um, it's the place where all the light beams cross, right? Uh, and invert. Going to the perspective question. So mathematically, you are recreating the space bounded by the near and far clip frame in a space defined by the lens of the focal length. So if you could imagine one pixel as being a vector from the lens to some point, you are literally just doing a magnitude scale. If that's the case, how do you handle the fact that you're mapping a curved surface onto a plane? You mean, <clears throat> what do you mean by a curved surface? Do you, because remember, we don't really project curved surfaces uh, in the 3D pipeline hardly ever. Uh, there are some things that we could talk about that, like if you're projecting NURBS into from, if you're going to project things that actually themselves have the ability to project, there's a whole other set of things you have to talk about. But we only really project points. So we've, we usually convert curved surfaces to fixed points and we just use lots of them to approximate the curved surface, right? Um, so we don't ever have to ask the question, how does a curved surface in the world project uh, onto a, into a curved surface on the film back, right? But maybe that's not what you're asking. What you made, said made sense, I think I get it. Thank you very much. I'm going to mess around with it and get things scaled. Yeah, sorry it took me so long to get there. Like I said, one of the problems with the pinhole camera thing is I've kind of forgotten how to think about it very efficiently. Um, uh, 
there's just, you know, human brains aren't great, including mine. And so I forget a lot of stuff. You know, you work through it and then you just you page it out. And you remember how to get back to it if you need to, but it takes some time. Um, so, yeah. How much do curved monitors complicate this? Um, they, you know, they don't really complicate it much at all. Um, if you wanted to take a curved monitor into account, you certainly can uh, in your projection. The problem that you actually get uh, with curved monitors is that piecewise linear approximations don't actually work on curved monitors because the monitor is curved. So if you really actually want to do proper rendering for a curved monitor, you actually need to change the 3D pipeline to support um, proper, what's called perspective rasterization. Um, that's actually not that hard, but it doesn't, you can't do it on modern hardware. It doesn't support it because the rasterizer is fixed. Um, to be more specific about what I'm talking about, so if we wanted to extend our projection equations to work properly on a curved monitor, it's not that hard. Uh, all we have to do is say, oh, when we go ahead and project these things, then when we're projecting, instead of just forcing things through a matrix and saying that we're done, um, we just need to go, oh, this, this back here that we're projecting onto, right, is, is curved. So the distance that things go when they come through here is not going to be the same. It's not that hard to work out the math for that because you know based on the direction of the thing being projected what that distance is for the curved monitor, right? So it's not that bad if you had to work that out, but the problem is then you're going to get specific discrete answers for like points of a polygon and then when you rasterize, you're going to interpolate between that directly. And that's not what you actually want. You want the whole, you want every pixel to, to properly have taken into account that perspective warp, right? But like I said, that's, it's actually not that hard. You we could have built all 3D hardware to do this. It's just we didn't because, um, and by the way, curved monitors isn't the most interesting case. It's actually... Uh, lens eye optics that are usually the interesting case but they have another problem which is rgb gets shifted differently through a lens it's a really long story but um Um, so I have a particular paper that I want to reference right now, um, and I'm having a really hard time thinking of what its name is, so I can't find it. There it is, I think, yes. Um, so this paper is literally about this exact topic and I highly recommend reading it if you just want an interesting read. It is useful to no one at all at this point um, because you can't do it uh, in hardware as far as I know. Um, but you know, you could have done it. So uh, at least I think, am I wrong about this? I don't, I don't remember if they came up with like a way to hack it. I 
I don't remember if they tried to make a way to hack it into a current GPU pipeline or not. I'm sorry. I just don't remember. Um, but the point is, ignore whether a GPU can do it or not. You could make a GPU do it because it actually works the exact same way as current GPU rasterization works. It just takes the bounds of what could be the projected area of a particular triangle. And then when it actually computes the values at the pixel coordinates, um, it just does the correct uh, full 3D homogeneous computation of what they should be through the curved projection, right? So this does literally the exact right thing for curved projections. And it's pretty cool. Uh, that's, I guess, what I would say, right? Um, and like I said, it's really just about changing your idea of what the bounds of the projected triangle are. And then when you compute what pixels are in or out uh, and what the values of the pixels, you just use the homogeneous coordinates still to make sure that you're actually doing the full curve projection at each point. And it just works. The, the same pixel shaders will just work at that point, right? So it's really just about the rasterizer, how it's doing the, uh, the those, how it's feeding that, um, right? Imagine the true surface as being an arc with radius equals focal length. Oh, uh, okay. I, mm -hmm. So I, I maybe understand what you're asking about with the curved surfaces now. This is jumping back to the previous question. Uh, let me try to, to uh, give you, you a, a, a more uh, clear impression here. So again, with any camera, right? So we'll try to get out of the pinhole versus regular. There is some point where this stuff is inverting, right? And so for our pinhole camera, you know, light from the world is going through the pinhole and inverting at the pinhole. With our wide aperture camera, it's going through the aperture, right? So it's like actually all of the light is going across this entire surface. Uh, and then there's a pinhole, like it's not a pinhole. There's a point where the same location that goes through two sides of the lens will invert and project, right? So there's stuff like this, right? If the focal length is set to that, you get here. If you take these two going through the same point, so let's say you took them both going through here, where they would cross is probably the equivalent of the pinhole. So ignoring all of that, we have a point somewhere where the light beams cross and we don't know how we got there, right? When those beams cross, even if this surface is curved, right, versus straight, we don't care, the film back just needs to be the shape of the display. So if it's a photograph, it's flat. If it's a monitor, it's flat. If the monitor's flat, it would be curved if the monitor was curved. The actual projection on here, we're trying to ask where it hits a flat surface. We're not trying to ask how far this went. We're not asking how long this ray is. We're waiting until the ray hits our collector. So it doesn't produce, for a flat collector, it doesn't produce an ideal function that looks like that. It's actually producing a projection that is flat on the flat surface. And then we stick it on a flat surface and we're done, right? So no, there isn't a curve induced by the fact that these rays are traveling different distances. It's okay that they are, right? That's okay. Because we're making a flat collector of rays that are hitting it and then we're putting it onto a flat surface. We don't need to think about the curvature at all there. Um, hopefully that helps a little bit. All right. Uh, I think I have definitely talked enough today for my poor voice. 
Uh, I can't remember what questions we skipped. I hope they weren't super important. Um, Um, so there's only one it looks like we missed, which was if I wanted to create seamless terrains starting from a cube-like tile map, what algorithm should I look into? So that's a little bit too open-ended, and it also is a little underspecified, so I'd say I'm probably not going to take that one. I, I apologize. Uh, I was thinking that you'd want to solve the problem, that you'd get a differential zooming, but it seems like there's not too much of an issue. Okay, well, as long as, all right. So hopefully we've addressed all the questions. Again, sorry it took me a while to get around to, to um, a good diagram for what was happening in the camera land. Uh, it's confusing stuff, right? And it's because there's so many pieces that are interacting at that point. Um, you know, there's the concept that we're shrinking it down into the clip space. So, you know, you're inherently thinking of this like negative one, one, space and then you're like well what does that mean exactly because we're also multiplying by this focal length value why are we doing that and what's that doing to the values and and then there's the aspect ratio coming in as well and there's the divide by z and so you know thinking all through all that stuff you can see what it does mathematically very easily by just looking at the numbers um and where they go but it's hard to come up with an intuitive picture so I tend to like the film back distance way. That's why I initially went there, but it was hard for me to kind of get to the point where it's like, oh, uh, the right way to think about that in this space is to say the film back is a fixed size. So as you move it back, it doesn't widen with those projection lines. It's the same size. So you're collecting more or less of that as you change where you're at. And that's what scales the world effectively. I think that's a good way to think about it intuitively. There's a lot of ways you could intuit it. I find that to be a good way because I feel like it helps you take the next step, which is to start thinking in terms of real lens assembly sim, which is where you have to go eventually, right? Once you start doing a harder core 3D engine, you need to be able to think about things like uh, bokeh and lens aberration and these sorts of things that just don't happen with a pinhole camera. And so if you try to use just the, just the similar triangles projection and it's the only thing you ever thought about, um, you can't get there. So it helps to have your intuition think more about an actual physical assembly. I think that's a good habit to get into because it'll shorten the length, the, the, it, it shortens the gap you have to cross to start getting into more advanced rendering techniques later. Um, we don't do those on Handmade Hero, but you know, if you're someone who goes into graphics rendering, you're gonna have to do that. You're gonna have to think about those uh, later. Uh, all right, let's see here. I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, and uh, close things down. Let's see here. All right. Thanks everyone for joining me for the new episode of Handmade Hero. It's been a pleasure coding with you as always. Uh, if you wanna follow along the series at home, uh, you can always go to handmadehero.org and pre-order the game. It comes with a source code so you can play around with stuff like the Fogel Link parameter and see what it actually does. Um, that's it for tomorrow. I'm just going to pick up where we left off today. Uh, we weren't able to find that bug. We're going to have to see if we can hunt it down some other way. It's a pretty elusive one, uh, and I'm not really sure where it's coming from. Uh, so it's going to be a bit tricky, but hopefully we'll get it. Uh, we'll try to pay close attention when we see it next time. Uh, that's it. Hope to see you back here tomorrow. Same time, same place. Till then, have fun programming, everyone. And I'll see everybody on the internet. Take it easy, everybody.